Anxiety is all about, it is fear and survival. It's what it is in a nutshell. That's what anxiety is. Anxiety is when your radar system, your danger alarm system is going off. And God has designed it to where we have various radars that are on all the time, basically, unless you're blind or deaf and so forth. But most people have about five different senses going off all the time. Hearing, sight, taste, touch, and there's always our way, our brain saying, are we in danger? Are we okay? Are we okay? That's what anxiety is. It's a signal. Anxiety itself is not dangerous. It's a warning sign that we might be in danger. That's all that is. That's all it is. It's itself not. So you can't die from it. Anxiety can't hurt you. It can't harm you. There is no reason to be afraid of anxiety, but most people are. There's no reason to be afraid of anxiety, but most people are. Not only is our brain sending out signals that cause our heart to produce epinephrine and adrenaline and our body gets worked up. Not only is our brain doing that subconsciously, quickly. You know, alarm goes off and all of a sudden my heart starts racing. And I realize, what, what, why is my heart racing? Oh, I didn't even notice the alarm. Because on a conscious level, I didn't even notice it. But my brain does on a subconscious level. So our brain's sending out radar signals. And on top of that, or in addition to that, our mind can also cause our brain to send out signals by the beliefs that we have. So one is automatic, like yawning or your heart beating, it's automatic. The other is not automatic, it's rational. It's a belief that we have about something. And that's why I finished up last week, is it's a belief, so the very top page of top three, beliefs chiefly come from our experiences. Like if I touch that red thing on the stove, that hurts. And I develop the belief that Everything that's red is going to burn me. That's a belief. We also get beliefs from other people. Things our caretakers take, uh, teach us, implicitly or explicitly. What you believe about things, I'm telling you, causes so much anxiety in your life. I would dare say that most of the anxiety you feel in life is not based on the experience you're having in the moment. It's not your brain. It's your belief system. Beliefs are overwhelmingly powerful. So... Our brain can send out those, signal, those chemicals in our body that says, am I in danger, am I in danger? Our brain can do it automatically, and then our mind can do it based on what we believe. So that's why, I'll get there in just a second, then we, will, we, then we choose behavior that reinforces the fear. So when we go to relief, we'll do both of those, the brain, body, and then the mind. There's two different things. Does that make sense uh, at this point, what I'm saying? They both matter. They both matter. So again, one more time for those who are coming in, if you want another handout, it's the same handout from before. There's some in the back row back there. If you need a handout, go and get you one. Last week, uh, in, the, in, the, in our presence, we covered this, but online it cut off uh, because it's cut off an exact minute, and I, I knew that going into it, and that's okay, that uh, repeated mental distress, you can also have biological issues and so forth. It can cause general uh, disorders. Now, I cover these just briefly because I just want to make sure you're aware of them. <laughs> Well, people who, and I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. People who suffer from anxiety hear this part and go, is that me? I know, oh, I know all of them. I'm, oh my goodness, I have phobias and GAD and PAD. And so I just, I just, you know, they're just panic attack. If that's you, take a deep breath. Not everyone suffers from this, but anxiety disorders are the most common in our country, uh, maybe around the world, but I don't know those studies. I know in the U.S. are the most common. And these are the ones, I, when I deal with people and, and counseling, particularly the top one, generalized anxiety disorder is just very common. And that's a generalized. It means generalized means there's nothing specific. It's a general sense of you're always looking for something to be afraid of, something that's got you afraid of something. Did I turn the oven off? Did I turn the iron off? What if someone's at home? What if someone broke in? What if I have cancer? What if I have this? What if I... It's a constant, it's just a constant dread, a low grade, like a, like a low grade fever, but it's always there going on. There's always something to be a, afraid of. That's GAD. It's probably GAD. And women use it twice as much as men are likely to have it. There's handouts back there if you want them from last time, if you want them back there. Then that's the GAD. Uh, that's very common. You, you, it, statistically speaking, there's probably at least one person right now in this room or a couple are watching online uh, who do suffer from generalized anxiety disorder. Good news, there's therapy for that. There's always therapy for this stuff. Panic disorders are different. That's when you feel basically all of a sudden like you're about to die. There's a deep, profound, intense fear of panic. Now, remember, I said all these have in common, and no one's really in danger, just you're afraid of it. But the panic is different from generalized. So generalized, think of it, if you had a 0 to 10 scale, generalized anxiety means you might stay at a 3 or 4 almost all the time. But a panic disorder is when you get to about 9 or 10. It's just overwhelming. 
And if we have a panic disorder event, we call that a panic attack. And uh, panic attacks are just extremely scary when they feel like you're just, your heart's going to explode, your head. And, uh, but it's just, you're not going to. You're not go your heart's not going to explode. You're not going to die. But you do feel that way. Again, women are twice as likely than men to have this, but it's pretty common. But look at the numbers alone. GAD is almost 7 million adults. Panic disorders, almost 6 million. Social anxiety disorder goes up. That's very common. So you have normal interactions that normal people have to go through. You're very fair, scared of things like being judged, offending someone, embarrassed, being seen as awkward. Uh, my own view is that most people who are really afraid of public speaking suffer probably from social anxiety disorder or a form of it. Because what if I say the wrong thing? And what if the joke doesn't land? And, and what if my face turns red? And what if I start sweating? And I, I know I'm gonna, and I'm just, and you build yourself and build, and guess what happens? You do all the stuff you're afraid of. And then, it, 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 um, as we'll see in this, the behavior, it reinforces the fear you have in the first place, which is very unfortunate because you're not in danger. There's no reason to be afraid of any of those things. You're not in danger. Sweat doesn't make you in danger. I mean, your face turned red doesn't make you in danger. It didn't. If I said something awkward, who gives a rip? I mean, who cares? Who cares? No, kill them. <laughs> Grab a stone or an axe and throw it the first time. I mean, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense It's because it's not rational. It's, it's based on a deep fear, and that's social anxiety disorder. It's very common, over 15 million adults in a month. That's a lot of people to me. That's, that's a lot of people. And the phobias are particular panic things about individual things. That's over almost 20 million adults. Like, oh, I can't get me near spiders, arachnophobia. I can't be near beautiful women, venusrophobia. That's real. Uh, clownophobia, yeah, really. Sorry, Bonnie. It is. That's what people are scared of you, Bonnie. I just want you to know that. When they, I just want you, she's like, that explains... No one told me I was the cause of phobias. Now you know. Um, it's true. Uh, so, yeah, that's like, it's just a phobia. Clowns don't kill you. Spiders, they don't kill They hurt, but the general spider. Well, I know I worked with a woman, a real sweet woman, who was, had a phobia of uh, squirrels. I mean, just. And we had a lot of squirrels where we lived in Kansas uh, near the work, and she would, you know, she'd see them coming, and she'd start running. She'd, I, I'll say, and it was Lisa. I said, Lisa, what are you afraid of? They're just going to jump right on me. They're going to jump my face in my hair. Are they going to kill you? Well, probably. No, they're not going to. Just. So being loving that we were, for Christmas we bought her a stuffed squirrel and put it on us. She actually kind of liked that. She said, that's cute. She said, because it's dead. It's, just, it's not real, rather. Not, it wasn't alive and dead. It just was fake. And, but those are phobias. You don't have to spend your rest of your life. You do not have. You do not need. You mustn't not need to. Spend the rest of your life with these phobias, these disorders. You don't have to. If you want to, you can. Sharks are real. That's a great point. And when you're swimming with them by yourself and you're bleeding, you have reason to be anxious. That is a rational fear. That's not a disorder. That's a rational fear. Seeing a shark is not a rational fear. Seeing a shark and your heart racing and, oh, my goodness, I'm seeing a shark. I like watching someone go on a roller coaster doesn't make me die. I'm watching it. That's your brain sending out signals for something. Am I in danger? And you go, yes, we are. Well, no, you're not. Like in reality, am I in danger by looking at a picture of a spider? No. And the fact that you say to me, yes, I am, means no, you're not. You're not in danger. If you stand on the stage right now and talk to everybody on the spot extemporaneous like I'm doing, all of a sudden you get in danger. No. No, no one's pulling up guns and going to shoot me if you stand on the stage. You're not in danger. So it's an irrational fear. If I'm swimming and I'm, my leg's hanging with blood and there's a shark, yep, I'd be nervous, yep. And that's completely rational. You have a reason to be afraid. You have a reason to be afraid. If a car's about to run into me and my heart races, yep, that's my brain going. Am I in danger? Yes, I am. Steer this way. That's very rational. That's not a disorder at all. Birds? Okay, birds another one. Birds are not a threat to you. They're not a threat to you. Yeah, yeah, that movie is, but not the. I'm gonna move ahead. There's another any question or comments about disorder. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. How do you overcome a phobia? Well, the nutshell answer is you need to go to therapy and counseling. But you do. There's no way. Like I just, okay. In my opinion. I've never seen this happen. You just say, God, give me the strength, and you're over it. It's we. You slowly is called desensitize you. We slowly put you in situations where we retrain your brain to not associate danger with that image. And the first place I start with a person is I get them in a real deep, relaxed state. 
deep, heavy, what I'll talk later on, breathing real deep, fully relaxed. We'll have mental images of things that cause you to be very, very calm. And I'll slowly introduce things like, let's say it's spiders. I'll say the word spider. So you want to introduce these words and concepts where you're in a complete relaxed state. It trains your brain that it's not a danger. And as your heart goes up, we stay there for a while. You just, it's called desensitization. You start from there, and the image eventually you can show them pictures, you can show them videos, you can get a place where you can get near them. So being afraid of elevators, good. Being afraid of, you were locked in an elevator, just repeating for the online, because they can't hear you. Um, so you're afraid of elevators, you've been locked in an elevator before, and here you make yourself go in the elevator. You do okay unless, unless you're by yourself. That's fantastic that you do it anyway. That's fantastic. Right, but the key, you're still afraid. The, the key is, and this is the key, the, and we'll talk about a lot of keys, but one of the major keys is the goal is to make choices that the adult ego state wants to make, not based on irrational fear. The goal is not not to feel anxiety. The goal is to not let anxiety make decisions for you. So it's irrelevant if you're scared the whole time you go down. You need to go to the elevator. If your brain goes, I'm fine, then go in the elevator. Well, I felt scared, but we still did it, didn't we? The goal is to make decisions based on rational thought, not make decisions based on irrational fears. Like, no, what if, what if? No. Now, but David, I don't want to feel that way. Well, no one wants to feel that way. And you can go through therapy and desensitization to actually make sure the brain stops uh, associating elevator with danger. There are steps you can take to help tremendously. You can start in small time, what I just said, relaxing, you can do things. You can go into small spaces like a cardboard box or a closet in a house and start, and I would work, the therapist can work with you, deep breathing exercises and things you tell yourself, because all it is, your brain's associated. It's kind of like an allergy. For whatever reason, our brain decides that thing, that pollen is somehow a danger to me. It's not, but the brain, and I can't retrain that part of the brain. I can retrain myself to think that I'm not in danger in an elevator. But the main success story is I still went down it. I'm serious about that. That's a lot of people, well, I just want to be happy and peaceful. Well, good. But if we make decisions based on all the time, then we're like little children or addicts. And that's not what we want. We want to make decisions based on what's rational. Good question. Do you think we have more anxiety because society makes us that way or has it always been? My own view is that uh, I alluded to this before, but I'd say more, I guess, now. My own view is that, in general, in the Western world, particularly in America, I'll speak for us, and I've not been around ever in America, so I know this is a generalization, but in my experience living in probably, what, 10 states or some like eight states, that seem to be a commonality, that in general, people these days are not trained. They do not have the capacity or the tool, internal emotional tools to process negative feelings. They're like little babies. They might be 80 years old, but on the inside, they are a scared little child who was never taught how to process disappointment, frustration, anger, sadness, and loss. And so they don't have the capacity to deal with it. And they are ill-equipped. Secondly, society, of course, just means a bunch of people. Then they're surrounded by a bunch of other people in the same boat. And they try to get their needs met in ways that are very unhealthy. So I, so my own view is not that society does it as it is we're all in the same sandbox. Most people are. I do think that. And I think it's, the, why, why is that? Because our parents failed us. We're supposed to have parents who teach us this. It's supposed to be. Like you teach you how to do A, B, C, D. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to learn how to deal with emotions. And most people didn't have parents do that. They're supposed to. Praise God, we can reparent ourselves now, which is why I'm doing classes like this. You can reparent yourself now. Good, good. You think that's why some people do drugs, cut themselves and drink? Absolutely why they do it. I'm about to talk about it in just a second. That's exactly why they do it. At least that's my view too. Let me say it that way. That's exactly, that's the standard view. I completely agree with you. They do not how to deal with it. That's exactly right. When I hear people who are addicted to their alcohol, I mean, I've met, and of course my minister, I've met many people addicted to many things. My first thought is not sinner. My first thought is, oh man, they're wounded. Wounded people do things like that. And usually driven by shame. And they think that helps them somehow. So we've got to get to the root of that first. Uh, good good questions. Good, Those are my thoughts on it. Keep going. Nothing else? Raise your hand if you have a disorder. I'm just kidding. Don't have to. Uh, if you want to, you can. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But for real, though, do you might want to talk about a disorder or we'll move on? Anybody? 
So, yeah, so I had a panic attack on the interstate a while back. Now I won't do it and so forth. Yeah, every single time you choose not to do it, you're teaching your brain that you are in danger. You are reinforcing the phobia. It's exactly what you should not do. Your head could explode, an alien can come down, a pink elephant could land on your car. There are enormous amount of possibilities. The issue is if, adult, if you were telling your own daughter, is it likely that you will have one? The answer is no, it is not likely. Do you suffer from a disorder where you have seizures? That's different. That's different. You may say, well, maybe so. Let's work on that's a medical condition. But that's a rational concern. But it is irrational to say because there's a point zero zero something percent I might, therefore not. Well, yeah, you might have a heart attack and a stroke. Then the question is, and therapy would say is, then let's say what would happen if you had one? What are, the, what are the next steps you would take? Let's do this right now. So before that happens, what would you do? Well, that's what we do with everybody. That's exactly why specialists go to schools and say, well, if there's a fire, here's what you do. We practice things called drills so that they don't just lose their mind when the alarm goes off and sees the fire and they run out going crazy. We practice this stuff. And that's because when we've practiced it, we have teach the brain, oh, I, I'm prepared for that. That's exactly what we're supposed to do in real life with us adults. Oh, well, let me have a drill. I'm going to drive on a highway, and I'm going to drive on a so-and-so. And I'll say, well, there's ways you can, that internal dialogue you have, breathing exercises really help. But every time you make the decision to avoid it, you're teaching a phobia to start and reinforcing the phobia every time. Every time. So I, the first step is I would stop avoiding it. And then when you make it, you're lying, you're like, oh, I did it. Yeah, I did it, because I can. You tell yourself, yeah. Not, no, I barely survived. No, I didn't. I didn't barely survive. I survived just fine. I was just traffic. I don't know how to drive a car. So that internal dialogue. Now, in counseling, we could go through specific examples. But, yes, you could get better if you wanted to. If not, spend the rest of your life taking the country road. You know, you could. People do. I wouldn't do that. To me, that's sad. I mean, I wouldn't spend the rest of my life driven by fear, literally, or pun. I'd, I, I wouldn't do it. But that's, that's me. I had a question. My concern, yeah, and I hear that, like getting help and having a person with you and so forth. Those are, in therapy, those are good maybe first baby steps. The goal is to do it with no one in the room, like an elevator by yourself. That's the goal because, because healthy uh, adults do not depend upon other people to get things that get done. They do not do that. Unless they are in a literal state of neediness, then it's completely appropriate. Outside of that, we don't, yeah, yeah, we don't. I need you to hold my hand and walk across the store. Why? You don't need it. You want it, and I'll talk about that in a second. You need, but you don't need it. You're afraid you do, but you don't. No. So we'll talk about that. No, it's a good question. Anything else about that? Good question. That's a good. That, I mean, it's a common one. So I get scared, and it's just when I watch the news, read the news, social media. So I got off altogether. Is that bad? I don't think it's bad. I think it's unhealthy to make decisions based just on that. Now, I'm a fairly healthy adult. I don't prefer watching the news all the time either because if you don't, it just, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, just in case people don't know this. They hire big, they pay top dollar for psychologists to train them on how to write news stories to make you afraid. Because the number one reason why you will watch it is because the brain is built to survive. And they know that their demographics are people of certain has very, very specific. They want to know if it's 23-year-old to 36-year-old white females who lived in blank, 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 what are they afraid of the most? What's their life? They know probably what minivan you drive, who you vote for, how many Starbucks you have. It's all this metadata is amazingly accurate. And so they take what they think you already value, and then they spin a story that makes you afraid of that. And that's why in particularly white neighborhoods, they don't talk about black crime on black crime that much. That's not that exciting. We go, so what? They want to talk about crime in a white neighborhood, and people are going to watch. They'll say, up next, why your kids might be dead by tonight. Up next, storm's on the way. See you at 10. It's to make your brain do exactly what they know it will do, which is to make you keep watching because you're afraid. So the degree to which, of course, you're responding a way that you're trained to respond, which is they, these are experts who know how to do this on purpose, and the scripts are written on purpose the way they are. Deliberately, this is scientific. They paid, I mean, it's, I've read a lot of books on, the, on how they do it, the marketing and the metadata, the metadata. So is it bad not to watch it? No. There's nothing immoral or sinful not to watch the news. Not at all. Uh, if you're doing it merely because you're, you don't like the feeling of fear, I would say it's not very healthy. Why? Because you're not in danger. It's just a feeling. In fact, if I were saying, if I were counseling, I'd say one tip is then I would watch the news one time a, a, a week. And, so, and we practice breathing exercises and things like that to de desensitize yourself to that. And also have a great internal dialogue that says, that does make me afraid. Why am I afraid? Let's talk about that. It's every time you avoid it, you develop a phobia and you increase the phobia. 
Uh, does that mean you, again, the, the corollary is not, I need to get on everything possible on 24-7 news. No. 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 I mean, I, at least I wouldn't. I don't know why a Christian has no moral obligation to do that. Uh, but to make a decision based on an irrational fear is unhealthy. So the all or nothing is what makes you go, uh. Eh. And, and I respect people like, social media is all of the devil. I'm off altogether. I mean, okay. I don't think it's all of the devil. I know many people, I mean, people come to Christ. They have scripture verses. They have, I try to use mine for good, even being silly. But anyway, no good. So you don't have to spend the rest of your life not watching the news unless you want to. If you don't, that, that's fine. I just... I would hate for you to learn the lesson that every time I'm really afraid, I have to avoid it because that would be unfortunate because you don't have to be. You're not, it's just, it's just anxiety. Anxiety won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. That's good. That's a common one too, by the way. Yeah, yes, sir. So for online, yeah, the concern, he was saying the concern of people getting, everyone gets a trophy. Does that basically have an effect later on in life? Uh, the answer is yes, because that is a way to avoid. There was a, there's a big m movement back in the 80s, and you can really plot this stuff on a graph. You really can. Back in the uh, late 70s or early 80s, for the first time in American culture, uh, most uh, households had men and women in the workplace. And so they developed a brand new phenomenon in the history of the, U in the U.S., which is children staying at home without mom and dad there all the time. And to deal with that, they had a big push called the self-esteem movement that pushed because kids, they felt lonely, they were latchkey kids, and they watched TV. That's the rise of you know TV and cartoons and so forth. And so what many parents did out of a feeling of guilt that they're not being the mom, and particularly the mom, moms usually struggle with that more than men, uh, were not giving them what they think they should be giving them. They tried to make sure they felt happy all the time by buying them whatever they wanted and helping them avoid negative feelings. And so they started pushing this all over the school systems and sports systems. And I don't want my kid. He's doing the best he can. And so to help, since the mom, you sometimes the dad, can't deal with the negative feelings of feeling guilty for working outside the home to pay the bills, instead of processing those feelings of negative feelings, they try this, what everyone does in general, then they try to change other people so they feel better about themselves. And that's a form of avoidance is all that is. And so now if I can control you getting a trophy, I'll feel better on the inside myself because you'll feel happy for a second. But what you just taught the child was to be afraid of negative feelings, to be afraid of disappointment, to be afraid of failure. That is a wretched, horrible, pathetic thing to teach a kid. And most kids are taught that all the time. They're, they come to the rescue, they're helicopter parents, and they fall down. It happens all, I go on for a long time, I won't go long. Say answer is yes, I go on for a long time. So I, do, I agree. Does that mean every child develops a disorder? No, 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 I'm just saying. But it is indicative of an American mindset that I can't let you be disappointed. Yes, you can. Not everyone's a winner. No, they're not. I taught at a high school. They're real big on leadership. And I get it, but I, I, mean, I used to tell them kids, everyone's not a leader. They're just not. And it's ridiculous. If you have a bunch of leaders, who are the followers? I mean, this is silly. It's just a lot of the kids are like, I don't want to be a leader. You're not. That's okay. It's, I mean, you're not less than just because... Anyway, it's like everyone's not a winner either. I just, anyway, I wrote a blog called um, "You Can Be Everything You Want to Be," and the first line says, "You just you can't." I'll just I'm kidding, and the whole thing is I do a, it's on my 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 website, and I get so many comments from that people who see it on Twitter. I go, "Thank you so much," because I just this is you've probably been told you're the best singer in the world and you can do whatever you want, whatever. And watch American Idol, and the kids come out just audition. They're just bawling, weeping. The world's over. My mama always told me I was the best singer. She did, but then reality hits you. And that's what reality is. The things that bump up against you real quickly, and you sabotage your kids dealing with processing reality, which is you're not the best singer. You're not the best, and that's okay. Well, let me move on to bottom page three, if that's okay. These are good. Y'all are going great. Thank you. On that anxious note, beliefs. Uh, behavior, rather. So beliefs and behavior. Behavior is we choose behaviors to reject or accept the danger, threat, or harm and sensation. We choose behaviors. yes. We choose them. We choose behavior that rejects it or accepts it. If we reject the sensations, we proceed as usual, and the brain learns that the warning signal was false. I hear a fire, an ambulance go by or something, and I go, I, look, I, might, I might notice, I go, okay. I'm choosing to go back to focus. My brain goes, oh, we must not be in danger. We developed the belief that we should not be scared. And I have that over the years. Every time I hear that, I go, I'm probably not in danger myself. It's probably someone else's they got a call. I developed the belief by that choice of behavior that reinforces it. 
if we accept the sensation of anxiety, the brain learns that the warning signal was true. We develop the belief that we should be scared, like driving on the interstate, like getting in an elevator, like spiders, like beautiful women, whatever it might be. And our three primary behaviors that teach our brain there is a real danger. Please, before you read this too quickly, remember, the brain doesn't know the difference. That's why you get just as excited you can by watching a good movie or reading a book as you can in real life on a roller coaster. The brain doesn't know the difference. We choose behavior that reinforces it. We choose behavior that reinforces it. So the first thing is we do is we freeze and panic. This is a behavior that, choose, that says we're doing good. We freeze and panic. The word is gorgonized. I didn't want to put that, but gorgonized. That's when we remain in a frozen victimhood state in the hope that the danger goes away. I just, I just, if I be real still, that's we freeze and panic. And so, good morning. So we freeze and panic. Uh, that teaches us that we are in danger. And there's something I wish I could, well, because of time I won't. I can spend a lot more time on something happens in psychology we call disassociation. Disassociation is very powerful. Disassociation is when your conscious self deliberately disassociates from what's going on in reality. People will experience it. They'll say things like, I felt like I checked out. I felt myself floating outside of my body. I felt myself like I could see myself and I wasn't going through it. It was happening to someone else. This is disassociation is very common under severe trauma. If you've ever been molested, you probably were disassociating. People say, I just, I checked out and someone else was there while he did whatever he did. If you were abused as a kid, I disassociated. If you're in a severe trauma as a child for too long, your brain will, your mind and brain will disassociate so much you develop disassociative, personality disassociative disorder, well, identity, sorry, disassociative identity disorder. And that's when they have what we call, the loose term is split personality. Uh, which everyone calls schizophrenia, they're wrong. That's not schizophrenia. Schizophrenia in common parlance is completely wrong. So identity disassociative disorder is, a, is something different. That's when the brain or mind disassociate so much. Uh, their identity. So anyway, that's, that's a severe form of dissociation. On a minor form, it's when they just go somewhere else, think of a happy place, think of a happy place, and you seem to disassociate from the sensations in your body. That's a freeze and panic. If I'm just real still, I'll play dead. That's what it is, is playing dead and the hopes that it stops. Uh, that's what happens to people. That teaches the brain that was a real danger. Good job. The danger went away. High five to me. You played dead long enough, and now the danger is gone. Then there's flee. That's when you avoid the confrontation to escape the danger. It's all about the danger. Flee is leaving. Flee is avoiding it. That's not going to interstate. It's not going to elevator. It's not doing public speaking. It's not sending the email. It's not sending the text. It's not calling the person. It's not saying directly what you really felt because that's confrontation. It's all avoidance. That's all a form of fleeing. It's just running away. Flee, flee, flee. That way I can, not, I can escape the, quote, danger. When you do that every single time you do that, you have taught yourself, I was right to be afraid. Because why? When I avoided that person at church, I got around them or at work, and I went, okay, I made it to the car. I feel better. When you feel, okay, I feel better, those endorphins of feel-good chemicals, you taught yourself that what you did was good. Because your brain doesn't know the difference. You know, oh, I really was, there really was a lion chasing me. I'm glad we escaped that one. No, it was just Bill. But your brain, no, no, Bill must would try to kill us, right? Because that's why you fled. That's why you avoided Bill, right? Well, no, Bill really wasn't that much, But no, no, that's why we did it, right? Self, isn't that why we did it? So I wouldn't feel for just a few moments anxious. And, of course, there's fight. And that's when you try to dominate the danger to make the danger diminish or just disappear altogether. Every single bully you've ever met or known. Maybe some of you were bullied. I was bullied a lot in childhood. Bullies themselves are scared little baby children. They are scared, wounded little baby children who are deeply fragile and they're scared of being hurt. And they see this person in front of them and they think, I've got to bark up first and I've got to get you first before you hurt me. It's just like the people who say, I've got to break up with you before you break up with me. They do the same thing, but they do it with physical violence. They're scared, fragile children on the inside. They can be 80 years old or 8 years old, doesn't matter. But that part of us that wants to fight and beat them down, again, that's to deal with, that's behavior to reinforce the fact that we go, I really was in danger. I had to beat them down. Sometimes we fight with physical, you know, fists and kicking. Sometimes we fight with cussing. Sometimes we fight with um, manipulation. We fight with guilt. We fight with all kinds of things that we try to fight. It's a way to get you to stop. Sometimes fighting is yelling, screaming, losing control, getting red-faced, as it were, on purpose so you can just... 
And every time I'm in merit couples counseling with people, every single time I see and they go on, again, I don't think sinner. I think that person feels so fragile and scared right now. They're elevating themselves. I guarantee you a little footnote, if you're in a relationship where you fight often or you raise your voice a lot, I guarantee you it's because someone doesn't feel heard. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Someone doesn't feel heard. They don't feel validated. And so on those couples, I always work on communication for quite some time because that's why you're doing it. At least you're scared. So there are three major things we do to reinforce that we are in danger. We freeze and panic and maybe even disassociate. Uh, we, and I've done that myself. I've disassociated. That's some of my own therapy work I've worked on, not disassociating. I give you specific examples of that. Uh, we run away. That's called avoiding it. We flee away from it. Our three, we choose to fight. We buck up. We become the alpha. Uh, oh, oh, man, F them and this, this, and I'll show them and who they. Th that's it. So if you think about your own behavior in life, don't notice how you do this all the time. Uh, we do it all the time, every second. I mean, we do it all the time. Do you use a handrail or not as you go down the stairs? Are you avoiding them or not? Are you avoiding the fear that you might fall so you run to the armrail or not? Or do you fear, I mean, where, where do you park? Where do you eat? Do you have the same ritual every single day? You have to sit in the same chair at church every single week? I only look at some of you because what if? Every single one of you that are afraid of change, I guarantee you're being a fragile little child. There's a scared child in you that says that, that change might hurt me. It doesn't. It doesn't. It just doesn't. It might. I mean, it's all logically possible, but it doesn't. But that's what happens to us. We teach our, we, we behave in such a way to reinforce it, reinforce it, reinforce it. I could say more about that, but just get on, we'll get on some relief. Is that okay? Take a deep breath. I know some of y'all look pretty, uh, good, good. Yeah, no, uh, right. People pleasing. Yeah, we would call that in psychology a conflict avoidant. Yeah, so a people pleaser is a person who is a trying to avoid conflict. And I'm going to ask the question, what are you afraid is going to happen if you have a conflict? You don't have to answer me now, but that's exactly my next question to follow up. What are you afraid is going to happen? Are they going to stab you? Will you get shot? I'm mean, usually like, well, no, no. What, what's the fear? And at some level, what happened at some point in time, probably in childhood, probably in childhood, when the feelings of anxiety came up, and maybe it was legit, like some mom or dad looked like they were going to hurt you or something, you learn to keep your mouth shut and make them happy because the fear went away. And that one time it happened, it clicked, and now you fresh your life, you do it. Sometimes it's one time. Other times it's repeated patterns. In other words, sometimes you might go, I don't know why I do that. Well, I've been doing this since I was little. It's okay if you don't remember why. The question now is, do you want to keep doing this now? Is it a rational fear? Is it the wise adult thing to do? The answer, of course, it's not. Uh, the first one was silent treatment. Yes, yeah, some people give, some people interpret silence as the silent treatment, like you're punishing me. But my view is that a person, if, particularly if they're upset, it's wise to keep their mouth shut if they're going to say something that's, that they'll regret or is not Christian. We want to be kind and loving every second all the time. If we find ourselves more tempted not to be that while we're worked up, then keep your mouth shut. Take a break. I tell couples all the time, is it okay to take a break? Take a break. Say, we'll come back and talk. But the key is, say, we'll talk in a minute. Let me get, let me deep breathe. Let me take some moment. I'm not giving you the silent anything. I'm being wise. I want to make sure I don't let my emotional state take over me. I don't want that to happen. So that's one thing. Some people go, they're just being quiet to punish me. No, in that case, you're being wise. And so, but you can talk about that. If a person's doing it to punish, you trying to do it what? Give yourself 24 hours. You know you basically, right? Certainly more than I do. So if it takes you 24 hours, okay. I tell people, make sure what needs to come out of our mouth and our behavior is Christ-like. And if it takes you that long to calm down, then calm down. Really. Now, some people do the, quote, uh, quiet treatment, and uh, silent treatment, in order to punish them. And that's a way to have that person come chase you. So, mm. and what they want, what, when they're doing that, and I'll talk about later on, not this week, probably next week, um, is what in that moment, they're in a child ego state who really wants to be assured they're loved and safe. And the way they're trying to get that need met is by behaving in such a way that hopefully the other person responds like a nurturing parent and chases me. And when they chase me, I feel safer. So the best thing to do about a person to give a silent treatment is don't chase them. It will make them mad. Uh, that's not why you do it. It just means I'm not doing the dance. We're not playing this game. I'm not your parent. So if you want, you want to take some time, fine, but I won't let that be a manipulatory tool on me. I won't let that happen. That's what you're trying to do. 
But I choose to not let that happen. It just means you're wounded and immature is what that means. And when you calm down or grow up, we'll, we'll talk about it. But we need to talk about communication. I've done that with people, couples. And sometimes in my own marriage, we've talked about how to talk. No, we're not doing this. That pattern ain't going to work. And if I'm wrong, too, that's fine. But we're, this dynamic ain't going to work. And I'm not spending the rest of my marriage like this. That's not going to happen. And I mean it. Like, it's not like, we need to work on it. It means now, right now, this is getting solved and getting fixed. And if we can't solve it right now, we're going to read every book possible and go to every therapist possible until it's solved because I did not sign up to this. And I'm in this together, but I'm not doing that. Ever. But if I reinforce it by running after you because you're silent treatment, you've just... The dance starts all over. It teaches them that's what's supposed to happen. It's not healthy. That's more than you ask, but that is what I would, the minimal. So praise God that can be redeemed. You don't have to be. But listen, it's very wise of you. It's very wise to say what you said, a lot of things, which is one thing is my mom did that. It's very wise to recognize where it came from, usually, because it really helps us on a psychological level distance ourselves from that other person. When we start dissing ourselves with a person, particularly even visually, we start feeling more empowered to make our own choices. Because in that moment, you are channeling your mom. You are being your mom. Sometimes we want to be our mom. Fantastic. When she's like Jesus, do everything she ever did. When it's not, you go, ah, that was her deal. That was her wounds. That's not my wounds. And she had a wounded past. And she had a wounded past. And a wounded childhood. Wounded childhood. I bet as a human being she did. I bet, yeah, I, I believe you. It's, it's so true, this adage, you've probably heard it, but it's just a maxim that's so true. Hurt people hurt people. They just do. Wounded people hurt, wound, wounded people make wounds, they just do. That doesn't mean it's all okay, I'm just saying that's what's going on. Good thing, and I won't repeat all that only because it was a good bit for online people that can't hear all that, but helping your child feel feelings, but work on taking a break to process them, if I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah feelings are not bad. Our behavior can be. So we do want to teach people, our adults and our children, that it's okay to feel anything. But how you choose to express that is something very different. And a lot of kids don't know the difference. So you have to tell them, here's some, we used to, I don't hate and Julia, here's some proper ways to express your anger. We give them choices. They go, oh, there's two or three, four choices. You can hit your mom, yell at your mom. I'm kidding, I don't, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we, you know, you can, you, we tell them examples of what to do and then that's fine. I want to give a little bit of relief. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, it, I'm going to, Go ahead, just a few minutes. We got a few minutes left, good. So let's talk a little about relief. So the first part, you notice, again, one more time, brain and body is one thing. The other thing is mind. So let's do brain and body for a second. I cannot overemphasize how important breathing is. I can't. This works regardless of what you believe. Your brain associates slow breathing with safety and sleep and calm. You can force yourself into a relaxed state by deep breathing. Now, there are numerous studies that do the three and five and five and seven and 10, all that stuff. My view is I don't just deep breathe deeply. I mean, just whatever it takes. And what I found, all, this is a good trick too sometimes if you're really feeling it, is take a deep breath where it kind of hurts and squeeze on the inside really hard like you're working out and then go, oh. And then do it again. Usually about three times works enough. I'm telling you, I cannot overemphasize the power of deep breathing. Elevators, interstates, spiders, Bonnie, whatever it is. <laughs> Beautiful women. <laughs> That's an hour. Remember for us, my um, I'm telling you it works. So the very first thing I encourage people when they struggle with anxiety is, the first thing I say is when it comes to relief is, how good are you at breathing? I guarantee you, if you're anxious often, you're not good at it. Right now, some of you right now are barely breathing. You're holding your breath. You're literally holding your own, uh, you're holding it or it's shallow breathing because we're talking about anxiety. And talking about tells your brain, oh, I must be in danger. So you're already practicing it. If you take a deep breath and then relax, deep breaths before tests. Deep breaths before that conversation you're nervous about. Deep breaths before going to interstate. Deep breaths before that conversation you're afraid to have. I'm telling you, this really helps, as it were, put the fire out. Whatever that fire is, is a way to get the fire out. And the beliefs are about how to stop the fire in the first place. But be, it's amazing. And so one thing, uh, one book I read, which is a really good idea, and that is practice deep breathing and other kind of triggers for the week you might have. So, for example, 
let's say uh, I'm out of time. Every single time you start the car, you take three deep breaths. Or every time you grab your phone, you go. That's, it's something you would do throughout the day that every single time you do it, you're taking a deep breath. You're training yourself to breathe very deeply and calmly. Not because you're trying to stay in a Zen state all the time, but you're trying to make sure your anxiety is, is checked. The radar doesn't go too big. So deep breaths will help. So I'm going to stop on that because of time, and I hope you'll take a deep breath. So let's close our eyes. We're going to pray. Before I pray, let's close our eyes for a little bit, and I just want us to breathe for a little bit. I want you to count out just three long, deep breaths, and you use it through your mouth, nose and mouth, okay? Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us the capacity to grow up and be healed and be whole. Please help us breathe deeply. Please help us figure out in our lives, our minds, heart, brain, wherever it might lie, false beliefs or fears that are irrational. Please help us get them out and be healed of that so that we live the abundant life you want us to live. Help us, Holy Spirit, in the regular routines of life, not avoid things we think might scare us, that might hurt us. Help us trust you and do the right thing, even if it needs courage to do it. So please give us your courage and we'll do it. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen.